Today, Richie Halverson is a pastor and an evangelist, a success story in ministry. But not very long ago, things were very different. Richie Halverson was a drug addict. I'm John Bradshaw, and this is Our Conversation. Richie, thanks for joining me. Really appreciate you taking your time. It's great to be here. Now, I don't think I don't think we should define you by your past. You know what I mean. There's more to you than 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 your former drug addiction. But it's quite a story. And as a matter of fact, before we go any further, I do want to point out that uh, I read this very good book that Richie wrote. It's called Darkness Will Not Overcome. Notice the subtitle, One Person's Struggle and Recovery from Opioids. It's a great book. I want to encourage you to read it. It's tremendous. It will bring you or someone you know, maybe and someone you know, an enormous amount of hope. All right. How did it happen? You know, it kind of happened, as anything does, small, slowly over time. You know, it kind of came in the back door. In high school, I'd kind of recreationally gone away from faith and had dabbled in kind of the party lifestyle. Um, you know, it, it was something that was kind of exciting to me. My friends were doing it. So it was kind of that same generic story. Uh, and then uh, I got married very young, 19, just six months out of high school. And uh, my wife and I got married and um, quit doing some of the other drugs. But then started justifying the opioids because a doctor had prescribed them. So, you know, that was what, and I, and I justified those for a long time thinking, okay, well, I'm not doing the street drugs. I'm not doing the drugs that I used to do. And a doctor prescribed these, so these are okay. But these really came in and pulled the rug out from under me just as much, if even more than anything else. So what you're saying is that your initial experience with opioids, that was doctor prescribed opioids. That's, that's really interesting and, and, and germane to this in a big way because so many people use prescribed opioids, which, which as we know, end up dragging a lot of people to places they never even thought they'd go. All right, let's rewind before this, before this. You were raised in the church. Your dad's an evangelist. Your uncle's an evangelist. You used to work with us here at It Is Written. Uh, you, were, you were raised in the middle of that. What was it like to be raised in, uh, in that environment I don't think there's, people make too much about being a PK, but you were raised, you know, really immersed in ministry and evangelism. It was like the family business. Was there an expectation that you would follow in your dad's footsteps? Yeah, a little bit. Um, there was that, and I was often asked in the book, I bring it out early, often I was asked, are you going to be a preacher like your dad, like oh, yeah. your uncle? And yeah, my son get asked that all the time. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, when I was younger, I loved it. And, and yeah, I was adamantly, absolutely, I'm going to do this. Got to high school, and when I started drifting kind of away from uh, spiritual things and God, that's kind of when I really just didn't want to have anything to do with it. But, you know, I enjoyed, for the most part, growing up in a pastor's home, you know, that my parents live their life and their faith and ministry. It just was a part of the way my world was. I didn't know any different. It wasn't this negative picture that sometimes I hear talked about growing up in a religious home. Yeah, They encouraged me to develop my own personal relationship with God. And it was a God of love and, and grace. And so it was a great experience. Um, but it's definitely li like living in a glass bowl a little bit. People are watching you. They do have sometimes expectations, sometimes unrealistic expectations, and there was certainly that. Yeah, I think, I honestly feel like there's too much made of the negative aspect of I was a PK or this person's a PK. I know lots of pastors and lots of pastors' kids. For the most part, it's just a great, happy existence, not too terribly different from if your dad works in a shoe store or meat works. You know, it's, a, it's just what my dad does, and we get on with life, and, and life rolls by. Exactly. And it, man, the seeds that were planted during that time when I came to that place where I needed some help and I needed a foundation, I had that and I had that support and I had that spiritual connection that I knew that I could reconnect to. So I wouldn't change it for anything. I, I want to get back and get back to when you're in high school, but I want to ask this. When you talk and you talk about your addiction and so on, does it get to the place ever in your own ministry where you say, 
I'm not that guy or I'm more than that guy? Or is this something you're really happy to talk about because you understand or you feel like it's going to be helpful to many people? Yeah, you know, I am not that guy that I was when I was in active addiction. And anybody who has known someone in active addiction or struggled with active addiction, uh, then they know what addiction can do to someone. And so I'm not that same person. But I also know that if I let down my guard and I don't do the things that I'm doing right now to keep that faith strong, I could go back to being that person. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, but no, I enjoy talking about it. Uh, the painful experience, not so much, but it's a part of the story. And so I like telling it just if I can say, I can help be a part of someone else's recovery from addiction, man, I want to be a part of that. There are a lot of people watching us right now saying, I I'm glued to this because m there's someone in my family going through it. I one of my kids is going through it. I have a sibling going through it. There's so, it's, it's pretty common. Yet I think there's probably a slice of, uh, uh, of the church, any church that says, well, this is just so foreign to me. I think it's really important to understand that people struggle with addiction. It's just, a, it's a real thing, right? It's a real thing. Uh, statistically, it's like 90% of people either have struggled with addiction or have, they have close family or friends that have struggled with addiction. So most of the time it, it hits home. We may not be able to relate to the actual addict, but most of the time we can relate to the family of the addict or the friend of the addict. Yeah. And even though the church hasn't always been um, known the best way to address, uh, and I shouldn't say every church, some churches have always been a beacon of light for people who need recovery. That's right. Uh, let me just tell you, I have seen the church really uh, make significant strides towards becoming a place where people can encounter the gospel as they are, uh, but but God doesn't want to leave us there. He wants to make us better, happier for right, life. Right, right. Okay, so so I'm uh, I'm going to ask the question that lots of parents want me to ask, and that's this: You're in a Christian high school, and you started this slide. Okay, they want to know why you started the slide, and what they could have done to stop that slide in their kid. And my mom and dad still ask these questions. You know, my mom will still say, Richie, was there something that, you know, I did or that we could have done differently? Maybe we shouldn't have sent you away to high school. We should have kept you at home. And as parents, we play this woulda, shoulda, coulda. And the reality is when an individual gets to a certain age, they start making their own decisions. They start to have to, make a decision to put into practice the things that you taught them as a parent. And so parents need to kind of give themselves a break often. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, it, it's hard to say. I followed a similar pattern, I'd say most people do when they end up in this situation. Um, I started um, reading and watching and things that I probably shouldn't have that were, were not of God. I started kind of consuming things that slowly were dr driving me away from him. Uh, I started uh, hanging out with a lot of friends who were, who were good kids, but just kind of were like me who had this sense of we wanted to experiment life and do this and do that. And we just didn't listen to our parents when they said there's only pain there, you know? I remember reading an article years ago and the writer, an elderly fellow said to parents, you wouldn't take all the credit for all the good that's going on in their life. So don't take the blame for all the bad. I think you're right and I wanna underscore it. You said parents sometimes, maybe many times, need to give themselves a break and realize that when you're dealing with a kid older than about the age of one, they've got this really strong will and some kids will bend one way and some kids... Uh, now, that's not to say that parents shouldn't strive to do things right, but... Right. Okay, so you, you start to fool around in high school and, and it was what it was. Talk to me about how opioids got a grip on you. How does that happen? So I, I firmly believe, you know, and of course the Bible tells us, you know, we were formed in sin, you know, from the womb, you know, we're born with kind of a brokenness to us that we need to be reborn, become new creations. And so I really believe addiction was something 
that was definitely a weakness of mine and was manifesting in the beginning in the alcohol and the recreational drugs. You know, in the beginning, you use the drugs. In the end, the drugs use you. That's right. And really, the type of drugs is not the issue. Drugs are just a symptom of a much deeper issue. You know, you're trying to um, find something that will satisfy you that only really God can. And so, even though it started with the recreational drugs, it didn't take off until, um, but it would have had I continued using those. Um, but I stopped for a couple of years. My wife and I were rebaptized, rededicated my life to the Lord, had a really great experience, um, but had some back problems there and, and were pre prescribed opioids. Uh, and so started taking those. I mean, and they, just, they, they, they were just the last thing you needed, right? Yeah, and, and that addictive nature just really came out. And I justified it because the doctor had prescribed it. Sure. And so that's how. And, and you know, often people will run up to me and I'll have church members come up to me and say, Pastor, I, I threw all my opioids away. And, you know, all, you know, sometimes it's like, praise the Lord. That's great. That was the right choice. But then others are dealing with terrible chronic pain. They're right. not addicts and they need to take something and you need to follow the doctor's discretion. The key is uh, you know whether or not you're taking it because you need it for the pain or you're taking it to kind of escape reality. Yeah. And that's the difference between an addict and someone who needs to take something for yeah, the pain. Yeah. When did you start to realize that things were spinning out of control? You know, I realized once I started doing some of the dysfunctional behavior that you always read about and all the cliches you hear about, you know, breaking the law, you know, doing things that, you know, I was raised in a good home with good opportunities. And when I started lying to my wife, started stealing from family, and then got to the place and then hopping from doctor to doctor because the problem with drugs is yeah. your tolerance increases as you take more you've got to take more you got to take more and it just got to where i couldn't maintain i had to go to about dentist doctors emergency rooms sometimes four or five times a day yeah, just this, to get enough drugs this is one of the things you bring out so 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 i think clearly and effectively in the in your book and that is that well, well, why am I telling you? you continue, but it, it's it's this phenomenal thing where you 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 you're trying to pull the wool over this doctor's eyes, driving to the other side of town, phoning prescriptions in. Yeah, it got to the place where I, um, you know, I'd heard and seen so many doctors calling prescriptions. I thought, you know what? Maybe I'll give that a try. And this is the kind of desperation you get into when when you're addicted to drugs. You're obsessively and completely compulsively controlled by a substance you do such insane things you wouldn't do otherwise yeah so yeah i started calling in prescriptions and and for quite some time it worked and i got away with it and um until i finally get caught you know you do the crime you better be prepared to do the time and uh i was arrested uh, i'll never forget it it was at a kmart uh and i was going to the pharmacy and I could tell they were kind of on to me and I quickly went to make my exodus and uh, about four squad cars pulled out in front and I'm going to jail and I thought just my life was over. Um, but then that manipulation and that dishonesty called my sister, you know, I knew better than to call my wife. She would have left me there uh, with, and that would have been the right choice, but it called my sister and she came and, and got me and, and I just, uh, they pulled up to a traffic light and because uh, they weren't going to let me leave. They knew at this point, Richie's sick. And I just jumped out of the car and I took off and, and uh, found my vehicle, went right back to doing the same thing I was doing before that had just gotten me arrested. L let's go back over that. As I'm talking with you, I'm thinking of the, the family member who's trying to understand how their daughter could be so irresponsible mm. without really understanding what's going on inside that girl's head. Talk, talk about that. We, we're bouncing through this and I'm tracking with you, it's all good. But go back over that, I just did something really stupid and I'm gonna go right back and do it again. I just got arrested, I'm gonna go back and do it again. Explain how and why that happens. 
You know, that is what we call just the insanity of addiction. You are not thinking straight. You can't think straight, right? Yeah, you're not thinking straight. You have this tunnel vision and just this complete, you know, it's either don't do something illegal and stop using, but you're so physically, emotionally, and it's a spiritual battle that's going on that most of the time the addict doesn't decide to not use. They go to, they have to stoop to greater levels of desperation. Um, they lie to themselves, denial, dishonesty, and selfishness is at the root of addiction. Uh, and um, when a drug addict uses and gets caught in that, they really just aren't thinking logically. Um, they're just thinking of just doing the same thing. It's that insanity of doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. You know, this time it'll be different. This time I won't get caught. This time I'll get enough drugs to last me. And it's just a lie that we, that we tell ourselves when we're caught in that grip. Yeah, the addict just finds himself a hurt place in a place that they really just can't do anything about, right? Yeah. yeah. Because they're addicted and they're caught. You use the drugs, the drugs use you. What was your family going through? What were they, how, how were they processing? Talk about your parents um, as generally as you can, I suppose. But what, what goes through the minds of parents when their boy is just gone off the deep end? Yeah, because they try to help. Yeah. Oh, yes, absolutely. And um, if it wasn't for my family support, my wife's support, and my my parents' support, and my in-laws' support, I never would have gotten the help eventually that I needed. Um, so it was huge. But um, it was a it was a massive struggle for both my parents. Being a minister and being in the church, there is a feeling as pastors that you know we need to be this example to the people that we minister to. And sometimes you don't feel like you can share what's going on. Sometimes you're afraid it'll be a, a negative reflection on God by sharing what's happening in your child's life. And so I know my mom and dad both felt very alone during those times. Like, and there is this shame that comes in there like, man, you know, this is a reflection of us. And they take a lot of that on. And so they don't share and talk to people and find the support they need. And they need just as much support and prayer and help as anybody else. So it was very difficult for my parents. And uh, I remember my mom told me about a time when she was, they were in doing some evangelistic meetings. And she was talking to one of the greeters there that was a part of the volunteer team. And this this uh, lady shared a little bit my mom from something the lady shared she knew she could trust this woman and she started sharing about what i was going through man richie's been in and out of treatment centers he's in and out of jail we don't know what's going on and the tears just started flowing and she just started sharing and couldn't share enough and really that was very therapeutic for her and helpful for her but um Prayer, prayer, prayer is what, what got my folks through in that time. Mm, mm, mm. I'm with Pastor Richie Halverson sharing about his remarkable life story. And you can read more about that right here. The book is called Darkness Shall Not Overcome. I encourage you to read it, get it, share it with somebody. It'll be a blessing to you and others. More from our conversation in just a moment. Welcome to Line Upon Line, brought to you by It Is Written. Here at Line Upon Line, we get to answer your Bible questions. How does God hear prayer? I wonder, am I truly part of God's kingdom? Can you help? Was it God's plan for sin to come? Why did God place Satan in the Garden of Eden? Temptation is not sin. It's when we yield ourselves to that thing. That's when it becomes sin. You are going to wander your way outside the New Jerusalem rather than inside. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven, from with, heaven a shout, with a shout with the voice of, of the, the archangel. archangel. Your faith grows and your confidence increases so that the next time it just becomes easier and until it becomes natural for you. Easiest thing to do, get your copy of the Bible, open it up, and read it and let God speak to your heart. It's good to dig into the Bible. Absolutely. Where do we begin? Welcome back to Conversations. My guest is Pastor Richie Halverson. Richie, we're sharing about your, we're gonna to get to your present life in a moment. 
uh, let's continue to go through this, uh, this past life you live because you know, because you've had people affirm you in this, how valuable it is to hear, to hear people sharing and giving hope. You can get through. Your family is going to survive this. There is hope for your son, for your daughter, or your, your grandchild, whoever it might be. In and out of treatment centers, uh, in and out of jail. You spent a little time in jail. Made a few visits. I did. Yeah. Does that the first time the first time you hear that door lock, what runs through your mind? The first time. Yeah, the first time, yeah, you just think, man, you know, my life is all over um, when they're fingerprinting you and, and you're being charged with a felony charge of prescription fraud, which is a big deal. Oh yeah. Um, that yeah, you start to feel like your life is over but it doesn't compel the addict most of the time to then turn around. It'll often, and what happened to me was you just kind of give up and you say, well, now that this has happened to me, I can't stop using, I'm, I'm stuck. I might as well just keep going. Mm. Rehab centers. Mm -hmm. So you went to rehab first time. Didn't, I'm gonna say didn't work. I don't know if that's the right phraseology. It didn't, didn't break the spell. Um, Many people will say if that person only just go to rehab. Yeah. Walk through what what's what's rehab like for the for the drug addict. You know, each time I, I went to rehab about four times, um, and each time I learned something. Each time I detoxed. Each time I learned something. It, it wasn't that the rehab didn't work. It's that I didn't work the sure. tools that I learned from the rehab. Oh yeah. No, yeah so right. that is the biggest key. Rehab can clean someone up. Get, get them clean and dust them off. But once you leave, you've got to then practice the principles you've learned. You've got to develop a relationship with God. You've got to find a community of people who are going to support you in this journey. And if you don't, you're going to end up back relapsing. Mm. And so that's what I did. Each of those things were, were important experiences for me to finally reach my bottom. Um, cause people will often ask what treatment center did you go to where you finally got it as though that treatment center right. has that magical formula right. and it doesn't all of them, uh, a good friend of mine and a mentor once said, uh, in recovery, he said, Richie, your bottom happens when you stop digging. Mm. And that's the key to recovery. Once someone wants to get clean and they stop digging, it works when you work it. In your book, you talk about finding yourself upside down in a car on a bridge, if I remember correctly. What happened? Yeah, I was just uh, on my way back to a halfway house uh, we, that I was living at at the time and uh, just had gotten this car, hit a little wet patch. It started to fishtail, flipped about three or four times, totally took out a, um, a telephone pole and I had, I had some drugs in my pocket. And so, and often I've heard pe of the other people experience this when you're, uh, often people are upside down in their car and they don't realize it. They're so kind of just out of it um, until they hit that seatbelt and they fall out. And that's what happened to me. And, but the first thing that went through my mind was not I'm upside down in a car or man, I'm glad I'm not dead or, it was, man, where are my drugs? Mm -hmm. And I just start patting down through the car, you know, broken glass everywhere, cut myself up. And that's all I cared about. That's all I thought about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's addiction, isn't it, right there? As I read your book, I kept reading about this, this young woman who'd agreed to marry you. And I'd read a little further on in the book and I'd say, well, I'll be buffaloed. She's still with him. And I read a little further in the book, expecting, expecting to turn the page and my wife left and we were divorced and that's that. Mm. But it didn't come to that. How in the world did your marriage survive? That's a long story in of itself, but, uh, you know, but by the grace of God and hard work is, you know, the way it, we made through it. It has to be a testament to the power of prayer, the grace of God. And it's got to say something about that, that woman who walked down the aisle to meet you that day. What yeah. an amazing thing. She stayed, you know, supportive and committed. 
and uh, was there for me. You know, when I came back after treatment the last time, I didn't know if she was going to be at the airport there to pick me up because the last time we saw each other was bad situation and she was there and um you know it it doesn't happen overnight right. healing takes time sure. but we both became willing to get the help that we needed what i i i i, I don't want to take this anywhere you don't want to go but i'm going to ask you this question why'd she stay and here's the preface for this question because you'd been in and out of rehab in and out of jail uh you you'd, you'd tried so many times it hadn't worked out so many times but each time she, she, she just hung in there a little bit longer. I don't know, and I don't know that you make this explicit in the book, but I, as I think back, this is the unknowable. I'm thinking, would Richie ever have got clean and sober if she'd, if she'd left? Or would that have just been one more shattering of your world? Would there have been less to go back to? So I, I wonder. Yeah. Uh, but how, why, didn't, why didn't she just say, I'm done and walk away? I have often said, if I was married to me, I would have left me, you know? I, I would have too, yeah, just so you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, I would have. But, um, you know, Brittany often have told me that when I was in active addiction, that was not the person she married. And right, she knew right, that. Right, okay. She knew that. We yep. had good times. Sure. Early in our relationship, where I was not to that extreme, when we were rebaptized together, when we enjoyed our first two kids um, and and their birth together, and uh, so she knew the real Richie. Yeah, that's important, and I think this is something that people really need to know. The the the, the real, the, you just got to discover that real person if, if there's hope of bringing that real person out again. Yeah, I, I don't want to cut you off. I think you have more to say, but that's such an important point. I think it's huge. And, and super important. You know, what's interesting is in addiction, if, if addiction doesn't get a marriage, often what's really weird is recovery will. And the reason this is, is because when couples are in active addiction, even the, the spouse that is not the addict, they've been lied to so much, mm -hmm. they've been deceived, there's so much anger and there can be the potential of such resentment yeah. that sometimes even when the addict or the alcoholic gets clean and begins working a program, the spouse needs to deal with that pain and all of that that happens. And sometimes you marry the addict or the alcoholic, you're used to them being that way, you can't deal with this new person who's actually working a program and changing. And so that's kind of like two strikes against a relationship when it comes to addiction. It's not easy, but my relationship's proof. You can do it if yeah. both couples are willing to get the kind of help and support that they need to deal with those past pains and yeah, hurts. Yeah, yeah, I have a couple more questions about this, but I'm looking to get to the, I mean, f f from a jail cell to a pulpit. Uh, some people might say that's not a great leap, but, but I think in all reality, that's a quantum leap. So we, we want to get to that. How in the world did that happen? But take me to, I think it's uh, Idaho. Last rehab, flew all the way out there. Um, was there anything different this time? What was it that, that, that flipped a switch in your mind that allowed you to say, okay, this time? One good thing was I was at that treatment longer than any other treatment. You know, okay. what's a struggle for a lot of families and with just the de dealing with insurance companies and all that fun stuff is often um, you'll get into rehab and they'll approve maybe five days, six days, a week, right. 10 days. And that's just not enough when an addict's been using every day for 10, 15 years. So I insisted, uh, and my family insisted uh, on 28 days. You know, a bare minimum of you, that. You insisted. I I did. I insisted at that point because I knew it was either get clean or die. Yeah. And so my family probably insisted a little bit more than I did, but I knew I needed a longer time. So, so you didn't go into the 28 days kicking and screaming. You're okay with that idea? No, I, I really had no other options at the time. I was kicked out of the halfway house. Brittany said, you can't come back till you're clean. Um, so I'm living out of my car. And my family said, hey, we're going 
we'll send you to treatment one last time. I'm really interested in why it mattered because when you're upside down in the car and you're saying, where are my drugs? You weren't concerned about getting clean then, mm -mm. you know? So what happened that now there's a, there's a greater, there's a, something greater in your life than your next hit? Right. It, it, it was because I did reach this point. Well, several things. I had gotten an, another felony charge for prescription fraud. I had a warrant out for my arrest from Nashville, Tennessee, Davidson County. So I had talked to the sheriff and they had told me, you got to turn yourself in. And so all these things, I'd like to say all my motivations were pure, but to get as far away from Nashville as I could yeah. uh, was also because I had a warrant for my arrest and I knew I had to get clean before I went before the judge. Yeah, okay. So there was that element as well, but there was a deep hunger in my heart. I knew if I didn't change, that I was gonna die. And I remember that first night there at that treatment center in a little town of Gooding, Idaho, I was on the verge of um, contemplating, you know, in the program we call it stinking thinking. I started thinking about how I could go con and get some drugs and go use. And man, I'm in the middle of nowhere. There is the nearest next town is miles away. And, uh, and I remember I was going and I was in, out in the hall. It was late at night and I was looking out at the door and I thought, and I remember, and, and it, it seems audible, but in my mind, God really spoke to my heart, whether it was audible or not. And he said, Richie, if you go out that door, you're going to die. Mm. But if you give me your life, you know, I'll, I'll rescue you and I'm going to use you in a way you wouldn't believe. And, and so that first night which was actually New Year's Eve. Uh, a lot of clean dates on New Year's Day. There's not a lot of clean dates for New Year's Eve. Right, right, for sure. Yeah, yeah so you spent that New Year's Eve unlike any New Year's Eve you could remember. And I prayed for the first time in a long time and mm. I surrendered my life to God. I started to listen, listening to what the people at the treatment center were telling me. And um, I, was, I was prepared to be, give it another try. When you walked out of there, did you say in your mind, that's it, it's done, I'm new? Or did you walk out of there thinking, this is a long road and one step at a time? Exactly that. I, I knew it was going to take time. I stepped out of that facility scared. Yeah. Because I didn't trust myself. Probably the first time you felt that kind of fear in many years, a good healthy fear. A good healthy fear. And people told me, you know, it's, it's a good thing. When people walk out, and they think, oh, I got this thing licked. That's when you, you see him again in a year or two. And that's how I was when I first went in. But um, yeah, I, I had a healthy fear and I knew I needed a lot of help and support. Mm. You came home from there? Where did you go from Gooding? Yeah, I flew home from there and my wife was waiting for me to pick me up and bring me home. How long was it? Once you got home, you arrive at home on, we're gonna call that day one. How long was it until you really started to feel like, not I've got this beaten, I don't mean that kind of, um, what made me careless, but how, how, how many days in were you before you started to feel like this could work? Or maybe it was as soon as you got home you felt that. Yeah, I would say even when I was still in treatment, I was loving recovery. I was loving being clean and I had really made up my mind. I never want to use again. Mm, okay. So when I got home, I was dedicated to working a program of recovery. Um, and they had, you know, I would have stood on my head if they had told me. And so I practiced all the principles, you know, I, if I used every day, I needed some recovery every day. I needed to be around people who had been where I was and that could be there to help me, who were once addicts like me, but were now successful doctors, lawyers, people of, you know, and I needed a program who understood addiction. I needed to develop that prayer life, to begin that Bible study again, to reacquaint myself with the God that I used to know. Mm. And uh, that, was, that had to become a daily, that was my medicine. And so every day I'd go to meetings, 12-step meetings. Every day I would go, I started going back to church and just started really, and, and that, by working it, uh, I was daily surrendering to a new way of life. You have met people who've been addicted, let's say, to smoking, 
mm-hmm. and they prayed, God took it away. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that I've met too many people who've had their same experience with alcohol, but that's conceivable. They were hooked on alcohol, God prayed, took it away. I don't know how many skeptics you've met, but over the years I've met some people who are a little skeptical of 12-step programs. Why is recovery or a recovery program important? Why don't you just pray and let God just take it away? You know, what 12 steps, and there's a lot of misinformation out there about 12 steps, but 12 steps is a very, first of all, it was developed on biblical principles. Sure. The 12 steps are based on biblical principles, but it is written and the program's developed so that it can reach anybody, regardless of faith, to very simply introduce these biblical concepts to people who may be a little kind of weary of faith at first. Mm -hmm. And so for that, it just really simplifies that process. Um, I would say anybody, even people who pray, and and I've seen that happen, my grandfather, uh, struggled with alcoholism. He was an alcoholic. And, and you know, one day he prayed, was baptized, and he never touched the alcohol again. Mm-hmm. And so that happens. And I'm not judging anybody's experience, but I know what I needed. And often, pretty uh, advanced cases of addiction, they do need that 12 step fellowship because it, it, they have the identification with people who've struggled like them. And it breaks down these steps that we can practice that really bring recovery. There's a difference between not using and actually recovering. Right. You know, there's a saying in AA, they call an alcoholic that doesn't work a program but just doesn't drink a dry drunk. They're just as miserable as they, they're more miserable than when they were drinking. They just don't drink. So the 12 steps is to aim at, you know, honesty. You know, denial and dishonesty was where my addiction took me. So I've got to get honest. I got to get real. I have to admit that I have a problem and hope. I have to believe something can change. Faith. I have to have faith that there is a power greater than me that can help me. And so through this process, recovery is possible. So uh, it's, it's not as bad as some of the different ideas and myths and things that I've heard. And I can honestly say it really saved my life. I'm not saying it is for absolutely everybody. But if someone's struggling with addiction, I would definitely give it a try. Yeah, I think what a lot of people don't realize is, let's just say, for example, the addiction was taken away. What then? What tools do you have to re-educate yourself, keep you focused, keep you in the right path? There's a whole lot more to the story, and I can't wait to get to it. Because what in the world happened in Richie's life that he went from uh, rehab to preaching the gospel and inviting people to give their lives to Jesus? We'll find out more. Our conversation continues in just a moment. He spent 32 years in prison for a crime he did not commit. More than half his life behind bars, even though he was an innocent man. Junk science, false testimony, and shoddy investigative work came together to send a man to prison for more than three decades. Join me for Not Guilty, where you'll hear from the people at the center of the exoneration of an innocent man. We'll look not only at innocent people being freed, but at the phenomenon of guilty people being pardoned. People who committed the offense, who broke the law, and yet were set free by God Himself. Every person alive has sinned and come short of the glory of God, and yet God offers pardon and forgiveness to all, absolutely free. Don't miss Not Guilty, where you'll learn that no matter your past, no matter your present, you can face the future with confidence, without fear, and with absolute hope. Not Guilty, brought to you by It Is Written TV. You know that at It Is Written, we are serious about the study of the Word of God, and we encourage you to be serious about God's Word also. Well, I want to share with you another way that you can dig deeper into the Word of God, and here it is. It Is Written dot study. Go online to itiswritten.study and you can access the It Is Written Bible Study Guides, 25 in-depth Bible studies that will walk you through the Bible. It's going to be good for you, and it's the sort of thing that you will want to tell somebody else about. 
so that they can dig deeper into the Word of God and come to know the things of the Bible intimately. As you get into the It Is Written online Bible study guides, you'll understand the prophecies of the Bible, the plan of salvation, and more. So don't forget, itiswritten.study. Itiswritten.study. Welcome back to Conversations. My guest is Pastor Richie Halverson. This is his book, Darkness Will Not Overcome. There's a fair chance you have seen it around. Maybe you've read it. If you haven't, it's time to. It is a wonderful read, one person's struggle and recovery from opioids. I I went to my office to grab the book to bring it here, and then I realized I had to call Richie and say, could you bring a book? Because I didn't have time to go to the bookstore, and I'd given my copy away. I knew that this is just what somebody needed, and it has been a blessing already. So, Richie, uh, childhood addiction, recovery, ministry. Now, I don't know if we can, I'm sure we can string that together really quickly. What happened? You came out, I met, uh, you must have got a job, you must have got working someplace, that's right. But that's still not pastoral ministry. So, let's talk just for a minute or so. You got your feet on your ground, started enjoying and experiencing a family life started working and bringing home a regular paycheck. What, what did life start to feel like? Oh, it was great. You know, often I would say that my worst day in recovery is far better than my best day using. You mm-hmm. know, I was experiencing life again and it was wonderful. Responsible, holding down a job, working, went back to college and started working on my undergrad. And, uh, you know, so it was awesome. Loved it. Enjoyed it. And you're, back, you're back in church now? Back in church, you know, supporting um, the ministries there. Ordained as a deacon, then ordained as an elder. Um, and then really just got involved in my local church. Mm. Somebody suggested to you, you might want to think about ministry. Is that what happened? Yeah, and I had heard that throughout my life. Right. But I had started working for a company, actually, Wilkes Publications. And... They printed a lot of great um, Christian material, you know, Happiness Digest and different books that were just really great about people developing a relationship with God. And so I started working for that and I started having a lot of ministry ideas, evangelism ideas, and I loved it because I could be involved in evangelism on some level, but it still wasn't quite where I felt like God wanted me to be. Mm -hmm. And I just kept having this kind of tug at my heart that pastoral ministry was where I needed to be, although I just had felt like that that bridge, that ship had sailed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, so what happened? So I finished up my um, undergrad, uh, and uh, it was in corporate communications, bachelor's in PR and corporate communications. And I remember reaching out to a good friend of mine whose father worked... Um, for uh, the Gulf States Conference, one of the church organizations. And, and I had reached out to him and saying, you know, hey, I, I just finished my degree, asked him if the conference maybe had anything for communications person, you know, right. in the yeah. department, still not thinking ministry is an uh-huh. option. Uh-huh. And we just talked, didn't think much of it. And um, no joke, the next day, his father calls me and says, hey, Richie, you know, Chris told me you're interested in being a pastor. Huh. And so I never had mentioned that. I never had said anything. Maybe Chris read between the lines and he, he, he heard that. I claim that verse in, you know, where, where the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, you know, with groanings sure. too deep for words. And um, God answered that prayer. So I very quickly responded, yes, absolutely. And so, man, the next, like a week later, I'm on my way down to Montgomery, Alabama with my wife and my family uh, and, uh, and am interviewing for a pastoral position. I had been, at this point, I had probably been clean for about seven years. Yeah. And uh, so I was excited and I felt like this is where the Lord wanted me to be. I wonder what's going through your wife's mind. You know, the, the memory of where you've been is probably fresher in her mind than it is in yours. What do you think was going through her mind when she's, she's driving with her husband to an interview to be a minister of the gospel when not many years ago, she, she didn't know if you were dead or alive? Yeah, 
you know, they often say that when um, God puts a calling on the pastor, he puts a calling on the spouse too. And Was that uh, your experience? It was, absolutely. Now, there were definitely some conversations and some, wow, I didn't realize that I married a pastor. Sure. You know, what did I sign up for? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, um, but Brittany saw God's calling on my life and she supported that. So now you're involved in full-time ministry. You, 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 this was how many years ago that you got your first job as a pastor? Okay, it's been about uh, 12 years. Yeah, you're an old timer now. All right, now you're pastoring in Cleveland, Tennessee. What is it that you love about ministry? I'm not, I don't mean just one thing, but what fires you up about ministry? You know, it's seeing lives change. You know, that's really it in a nutshell, is, is seeing lives change. I love seeing the light go on in people's eyes. I, I love uh, people realize that there is hope. Things can get better. And I love to be able to introduce the Savior who saved my life to other people. And so for me, I'm just passionate about that. I love talking about the good news with other individuals. And, you know, and, and going through recovery and my experience and 12 steps and, and just my, my experience with dealing with addiction and rehab, it's, it's blessed my ministry because it's allowed me to be able to develop discipleship and connect with people on a certain level. And, and I see this sense of when people, when I tell my story, people see that identification and they say, you know what, man, if he struggled with this and now he's doing this, maybe God can get a hold of my life or someone I love. And so I just love that part of ministry. How often do you meet um, church members who, who, will, who will tell you your story, your experience has encouraged them because they know this person or that person? Yeah, every, every weekend uh, I have someone coming up to me. I have a different person who reaches out to me. And wherever I go and preach, you know, there will be a group of people who've either heard my story or family who want me to pray for their child or their family member who is struggling with addiction. And, and so that's, that's where my heart is, is, is for people, just to let them know there is hope. We can recover. Yeah, and that, that was the, the statement I was just about to use. I want you to elaborate on that. There's hope, isn't there, whether the person's a drug addict or addicted to something else or, or angry or a thief or doing jail time for sheep stealing or whatever the case might be, cattle thieves. There, is there a single person that there is no hope for? Nope. There is not a single person that is, is hopeless. You know, if God got a hold of me, he can get a hold of anyone. Have you seen many stories in ministry? Tell me about an experience, if you can, someone that, that other people might have thought, she's hopeless, he's hopeless, you saw something in that person and boom, God did something great. Yeah, that happens actually often. It seems the people I think, yeah, you know, they get this and got it all together sometimes they don't make it and the ones i think boy they're not going to last you know they're the ones that last you know i think we just can't write people off and um i've seen a lot of people just be willing to surrender to a new way of life to recognize you know what i've been doing hasn't been working mm -hmm. and become willing to listen to someone else for a change mm -hmm. and to just start practicing some different principles that can bring about a change in someone's life and I love it. I love seeing that happen in people's lives, you know, and it doesn't, it's not just drug addiction, sure. you know. I mean, I just saw a statistic for, you know, pornography addiction among church going males yeah, is frightening. just frightening statistic. And when they study brain chemistry, the, the neural pathways that are developed from pornography addiction look a lot like the neural pathways developed by a drug addict. You know, it's, brain, it's this brain chemistry, um, these endorphins that kick in and you develop these neural pathways to that make it easier and easier to just use. You do it without even thinking. And so you can practice these principles in my story, and that's what I encourage my church, to apply it to your life. No, you may not struggle with drugs, but maybe you struggle with pride. Sure. Maybe you struggle with anger, temper. Maybe you struggle with lust. Maybe you struggle with... Everybody struggles with something, um, and God can rescue you from that struggle. Is there anything churches can do 
intentionally? Well, I, I suppose the answer must be yes, but what can churches do without, without throwing the baby out with the bathwater? To be a congregation of believers that's welcoming for struggling souls. Now, every single person says, that's my church, and most of them are lying, knowing, knowingly or otherwise. That's my church, but you and I have both been to a hundred churches where no one says hello, no one gives a rip, there's nothing going on there. If the church disappeared from off the face of the planet, and nobody would even know. What, what can a congregation do? And, I, and, I, and I, I don't mean tear up the hymnals and, and just burn the thing down. What do you do to make your congregation a place where Joe, the wicked sinner, can stumble in off the street and say, I, I, feel like, I feel like this could be my home. What do you do? Yeah, that's good. I think that, um, you know, God loves us just the way we are, but he loves us too much to leave us that way. Right. So I think creating a, cell, a really safe environment for broken people to come and be able to admit, you know, I'm messed up. You know, I'm struggling with this. And I think that's where we've struggled at times as a church is that, uh, maybe, uh, and not every church, and I don't mean to stereotype every church, but like you said, there are some churches where they're not safe places for people to go, where people don't feel like they can get honest about their problem, that if they do, they'll get um, punished for it sure. or, or be looked at in a certain way. So I think that's the first step. Um, one of the things that we, even I do as a pastor, I know what recovery takes and I know what someone needs to do to get clean but i am got so many hats I wear and I'm so busy that I can't personally attend to every person who comes who needs help. So I have identified an individual in my church who is familiar with uh, recovery, who's familiar with addiction, who is also a part of the church. So they're aware of you know, what the church teaches and there's not going to be teachings that are way off base or unbiblical. And she is my liaison that I will, when someone reaches out to me, I pray for them and then I send them to her. And she gives them that more one-on-one -on -one continual, okay, you need to go to treatment and here are some options. You need to you know, check this out, check this out. And so that's a great resource. So finding someone in your church who maybe is in recovery. I bet you have someone in your church that's in recovery mm. and making them kind of your person you lean on or you send people to do who show up at your church who struggle. I think that's another great thing that you can do uh, as well. Um, and I think educating people on addiction, just things like this, having someone speak on these subjects at your church um, is important because there are people all around us who struggle with A, B, C, D, or E, or maybe A, B, C, D, and E. If we're going to minister to people, again, not stereotyping, but it's really easy to build a church in our own image. Mm. It's for us. We do it so that we'll feel comfortable and so that our back is getting scratched most of the time. But, but church isn't, isn't just for me and you. Really, who's it for? Isn't it for the people, I don't want to say out there, but the people outside the walls of the church mm -hmm. who don't know Jesus yet? Uh, how are they ever going to get to know the, the Christ of the Bible if we don't in some way make them feel at home inside our walls? Yeah, I mean, we have to do that and, and recognize that just as God met people where they were, um, we have to meet people where they are. You know, we don't embrace what they're doing and, and, and justify it and say it's right and enable that destructive behavior, but we love them right where they are um, and we begin working with them, um, recognizing that we don't need to give them everything all at once. Let's meet them right where they are. Let's give them what they need right there in that moment. Mm. And then over a longer period of time will grow together. And that's what discipleship's all about. Now, speaking of growing, I might have wanted to ask you this question at the beginning. Maybe, maybe we'll have to dig into this in part two someday. You know a thing or two about growing churches because churches you've been associated with have grown. Um, we talk about church growth as though it's, it's rocket science or quantum physics. Um, I don't know that it really is. 
in your in your estimation and in your experience, what does it take to grow a church? I mean, simple principles. This isn't a church growth seminar in two and a half minutes. But if we want our churches to grow, where should we be aiming? I think uh, having your church become a safe place for anybody to come and encounter the gospel. Um, sometimes we feel like we've got to entertain people. People don't want to be entertained. They want their lives to be changed. Mm -hmm. And we have such a powerful message, such a full gospel that doesn't just affect one part of your life, but every facet of your life. And we don't need to shy away from that but we need to share it in just a very Christ-centered way that makes people feel welcome. Not less than, but feel welcome, like, man, that's what I want in my life. And that's what I've tried to do in developing at my churches and also doing regular events, uh, whether it be for the community or ev evangelistic, you know, pro proclaiming the gospel in a public forum. I do those on regular, systematic basis. Amen. And just to get that word. You know, Jesus said, if I am lifted up, I will draw people to myself. So that's what we do. We try to lift Jesus up as much as we can in the community where we are. And God does, does the rest. Again, another, another profoundly important question that I've, that I've left us far too little time for. God has done something great in your life. Every new day is something great from God, but nevertheless, in the context of what we've been talking about here, something great. Who is God to you? Who, who is Jesus in your life? And what does the gospel mean to you? You know, God is love. Uh, you know, he is my heavenly father who is, I love the prodigal story, uh, who's always looking for his son. And the second he sees his son open up, to coming home, he rushes to him. He doesn't wait for him to get to the porch before he loves him, he runs to him. Mm. And uh, that's what the gospel did, it ran to me. Christ came and he found me. He's that true older brother. The older brother should have left the father's home and gone and found his younger brother. Sure. And that's what Christ did for me. And he found me in the pigsty of life and he picked me up and he turned me around and he set my feet on solid ground. And so that is the good news for me, that God loves me just the way I am, but he loves me too much to leave me that way. Richie, our time is done. It passed by far too quickly. Thanks for coming and, and taking the time to share with us. It's been a blessing to me and to many others. Thanks John, so much. Thank you so much for having me. This yeah, has been awesome. Thank you. And there's something I'd like you to do. I'd like you to get a copy of this book. You can get it from wherever you find books like this. Darkness Will Not Overcome, Richie Halverson, One Person's Struggle and Recovery from Opioids. It's gonna encourage you, it will educate you, and you'll have it in your hands to share with somebody else who will be helped by what's written in these pages. Thank you again for joining us. He's Richie Halverson, I'm John Bradshaw. This has been our conversation. <laughs>